Well, hi there, uh, everybody. Welcome to Stratosphere Lounge. It's uh, your host, Bill Whittle, for episode number, scroll down for answer, 171. Is there a more unremarkable number than 171? I guess we're going to find out. I hope everybody's doing well. It's good to be here. Uh, and uh, this time i got to keep it brief. I know I say that every time, and uh, we've been cutting it from three hours down to about 90 minutes, but I need to be out of here by in an hour, a little bit after 7. That said, it's good to be here. Um, uh, we... Uh, over the last weekend, I had a chance, <clears throat> on separate occasions, not together, uh, spent some time with um, Viper Check and uh, known pervert miscreant Matt Lloyd. And uh, separately, they've opened up this, um, they've done it, you know, they've actually done it with this, with this game. They've opened up three entire worlds and I know we will not be talking about it after this I swear I just got to get this out of the way then we'll go to the questions um, but uh, it's such a feeling for me to be with uh, friends of mine and uh, have somebody sitting next to you in this virtual world and explore uh, these planets that look so tremendously good they just look so real landed on a back of a moon at nighttime and we got out with our flashlights and walked around watched the you know the sun came up and it was incredible and then by the way if you ever get a chance to uh, go for a drive with Matt Lloyd don't do it he drives like a maniac and then um yeah then a couple days later Matt and I went flew down to this place landed got in this six-wheel all-terrain vehicle and started running like crazy on a planet with I don't know 0.3 G or something we're just sailing through the air. Um, it's still buggy, uh, but this is something that I'd been waiting for and for since I really got into the game in middle of May. Matt's been waiting for it for at least a year. Uh, some people have been waiting for it for three or four years, but it was um, it's awful good. It's just really good. I feel this strange, I constantly feel this strange dichotomy when I talk about this because on one hand of it, one hand, I'm I'm really quite ashamed of it almost in a way. You know, it is after all a computer game and I'm all excited about it and and I remember my friend Steve used to talk about how he flew around the world in his flight simulator. He, he would say, Ah, I flew around here, I've been there. I said, Yeah, I've been there, you've been in your back bedroom sitting in front of a computer screen. Um so I just have to be a little careful about this, but one part of me feels like this is just, you know, it's just, well, it is. You're, you're sitting there in front of a computer screen. That's really what it is. It's a simulator, and you're getting to talk with real people, friends of yours in real time, but it's basically uh, a toy. And there's a part of me that feels, you know, um, this is pretty disappointing compared to the idea that I wanted to do this for real. And then the other part of my head says, Bill, there was not a chance that ever that you were going to see these kind of things for real. Well, consider, let me rephrase ever. I thought there was a chance I could see Mars or the moon, and I'm not over that yet. However, um, this idea of just being able to hop in something and zip from here to there and get in a, a rover and a buggy and just fly around. I love landing. I've, I, I started... I started Flight Sims back with Microsoft Flight Simulator 1. By the time we got to the, the second or third generation, I was doing engine off. I'd take a Learjet up to 90,000 feet above O'Hare or 70 or something and just dial in the altitude and just drop it with the engines off and try to um, try to uh, glide it in like a space shuttle. So I love, I love, I love it. I love the landings. I love, especially love... Um, zero-g kind of landings and approaches where everything is momentum and there's no aerodynamics at all. It's all just vectors and and velocity and, and just smoothing it out. It's a great hand-eye challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and I feel a real sense of pride. I put these things down as a beautiful landing, a nice approach. And it's like, yeah, all right, that wasn't, actually wasn't easy. Um, there's, wouldn't have mattered if I balled it up, but it, it's hard, and it's it's kind of fun. Uh, Bone Canoe um, has a comment 
Oh, I'm sorry. No, hang on. Hang on. There was one I really thought. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was Jonathan K. said, this is really weird to hear it expressed as if it were something real. And this is my dilemma. Um, it, it isn't real, but at the same time, <clears throat> it's as real as it's going to get for me. And by the way, it's going to get better every year. The experience is going to get better. So here I am stuck in this in this um, overlapping world of almost self-loathing for like, oh, you know, you're just sitting there playing a game. You're supposed to be out there for real. And then the realization that, well, whatever chance you may have had when you were younger, uh, this is certainly interstellar travel is out of reach. Interplanetary travel is just not going to happen for you, Bill. Um, I'd still like to get into space, and I think I will. I'd like to go to the moon. But in any event, so there's that consolation. This is like, okay, well, this is what I wanted to do. And I guess that's all I'll say about it. If, you, if you're one of those people who so wonders why I'm so hooked on this, this is all I ever wanted to do with my life. And up until May, I saw nothing that really held my interest. But back in May, the, the, the quality, the visual quality and the realism of it and everything involved, it just... It just really put the hook in me, and um, and it's been it's been really really fun. Anyway, that's that. Um, so let's get to our uh, questions for the day. Um, mentioned in uh, uh, members only. Um, uh, Nexus report yesterday. Real quick about that socialism in Venezuela video I did, and um, and I mentioned that uh, it was the sight of that tiger that made me rewrite that whole thing and and do it in the way I did it because um, the power of a picture of if you saw this socialism in Venezuela video, it's just this magnificent animal starving in this zoo. It's just like, this is what socialism does to people. But I've noticed socialists don't seem to care much about what happens to people. Um, but they care about what happens to animals. And when you see when you see a starving tiger, it's horrible. And you're almost relieved. In fact, you are relieved when you find out that not long after that picture was taken, Starving humans broke into the zoo in Venezuela and ate the animals. So this one's not being done right either, apparently, in Venezuela. And some leftists are saying, well, the reason this is happening is because all the capitalist countries are um, boycotting Venezuela and making it tough for them. And I'm not aware of that. Their 35% of their oil exports go to the United States. That's their number one client by far. There's always got to be some reason. They cannot face it. They never will. Um they're mentally ill, and uh, that's that. All right, let's see what we got here. Um, okay, uh, start with Steve Darrow, who says, "I watched backstage just now and want to remind you that the idea of a strat the idea of doing a stratosphere lounge with the three of you hosting together, I know it's." I know it is a technical problem, but I would be happy to have Scott and Steve on the big screen behind you via Skype. Have you thought any more about this? You know, Steve, I have, but the problem is this. We we do right angle, and, and, and Stratosphere Lounge is Stratosphere Lounge, and I don't know how to mix the two up. Um, I mean, this show is just a stream of consciousness kind of... Uh, romp. Um, certainly Steve and Scott could both uh, carry their weight on this kind of thing, but then it would be kind of three different shows. I'd be listening to Steve and then Scott and so on. And and if we really started to mix it up and make it interesting, then it'd be right angle again. Now, maybe there's a, maybe the way to think about this is maybe we could just do a, you know, like a kind of a goofy right angle um, live, but that's kind of what the backstage show is anyway. So I'm I'm afraid that's not. Just don't see any reason to make it happen. Let alone the fact that it's it'd be quite difficult to do technically. So I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, moving on. Michael Wilson. Hey Bill, I've been a 
I've been in a college class where we have been asked to write a debate paper on free speech versus safe spaces on college campuses. As a longtime fan of yours, I'd like to hear your opinion on this subject. I'm one of the few arguing for free speech. Oh, my God. Our professor has been great at making sure he doesn't voice his own political position so as not to influence the classwork. Thank you for your time. I'll give you my straight-off-the-cuff honest answer here, Michael. My, my gut reaction is let these ignorant, stupid bastards have the entire so-called university system. Just get out of there and let them have it. It'll, it. I really mean it. I am so disgusted with universities now that I just think we need to start thinking of them as mental institutions and, and treat them accordingly. That's certainly what their output is worth and, and that's what their output consists of. I just want to treat them like mental institutions and get the smart people out of there and, and learn online and just, just, just do it. Find a way. Or everybody goes to, you know, Hillhurst College, Hillsdale's College, whatever. It's something. I didn't go there, by the way, but I approve. Um, I just am so sick of it. I'm so disgusted by it. I really think that I, well, I don't, this I know. The more the more they um, the more they they go towards the safe space over free speech thing is simply means that the that the their confrontation with the real world will be prolonged and the more it's prolonged the more painful and 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 psychologically destroying it's going to be for them and i say good, now i'm at the point i say good i hope you all have nervous breakdowns i really do of every single one of you social justice warriors every single one of you antifa cowards i wish every single one of you has a major nervous breakdown when you finally get out of a place where you can bully people who basically think like you. The reasons universities put up with this is because they agree with it. They agree with it. They, 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 oh, well, you know, sometimes you hear people saying, well, maybe we created a monster. Yes, you did. It's your monster. And now you can live with it and it can eat you. And I'm going to enjoy watching it. I, in answer to your question, um, I, I will answer your question. Uh, but my personal emotional response is, I just don't care. Now, T.G. Gecko says surrendering territory, great plan. That's one way to look at it. One way to look at it is also cut your losses. You've got, you've got a, a lot of chips on the board, and you're holding a pair of twos. Um, so when is it time to, to get out? I don't, you're not going to win this fight. You're not going to turn this around in terms of like, gee, let's have conservative speakers. It's, it's not going to turn around. There's nothing you can do about it. All you can do is try and get an education into the heads of the people who, who understand this stuff, have some kind of fundamental understanding of it. Um, it's, it's the most disturbing thing. And, and, and I, when I say it's hopeless, I don't think the future is hopeless, but I think universities, I think universities are, are rapidly becoming the whalebone corsets of the 21st century they're they're the they're the wooden wagon wheels of of the future that they, they're just becoming absolutely obsolete and by the way by the way there's no reason for them anymore anyway there really isn't every day more and more information quality information is available on the internet and when i think about how much of an education i've given myself versus how much i got uh i am really quite shocked about it um so that's my emotional reaction now my reaction to the if you're going to get in write a paper about this um i think maybe what i would do is say something like um If we're even having this debate now, how long will it be before we're not even allowed to debate the subject? We're just even debating the idea of free speech is forbidden. And who forbids it? And why? And why are they forbidding it? What are they so afraid of? And what makes you think you have a right to be safe? What makes you think there's any place in the world that's a safe space? You drive home on the, on the freeway or you drive home on a, on a decent-sized road, 
I don't remember who pointed out, it might have been Tony Robbins who stole one of my videos basically verbatim. But you, you are driving down the road at 60 miles an hour. Other cars are driving down the road um, towards you at 60 miles an hour, and you're protected by a yellow line on the road, a little piece of paint that that thick. What makes you think you're safe? Nobody's safe. And what makes you think you deserve safety? And what makes you want safety? Who wants safety? Who's, whose life is safety number one? Who? These losers, these weenies, these absolute little creeps. And, and, and they can basically, I think they can just implode on themselves. I'm going to fight for the, I'm going to fight like the devil for free speech in terms of my free speech. But when the university campus um, faculty and the police department are on the side of the fascists, then it's time to leave that place. I, I, this is genuinely where I am now. It's just time to leave. I don't mean you have to drop your, your degree, Michael. I know you've got a, a lot invested and a lot of time and so on, but I'm telling you, it's, it's just the fact that you could say that, that they are even asking the question and the fact that you are, uh, what did what'd you say? I'm one of the few arguing for free speech. We are going to reap what we sow as a culture and as a country. That's bad. And that same dynamic of reaping what we sow is going to apply to conservatives and to progressives, and that's good for us and much worse for them. Yeah, like Dave Waldman's answer, and, 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 and it's a much better answer than what I just gave. He just said, free speech is not up for debate, period. Perfect. I wish I'd thought of that. It's a hell of a, it's the best argument I've heard. That's exactly how you handle it. That's exactly, that, that's, you just won the internet, Dave. That's the best thing I've ever heard about it. it, it that's, that's really the way to go, isn't it? And not even just get frustrated about it and say, well, you, know, can, you can have your, no. No. I'm going to say what I want to say, and, uh, and too bad for you. If you don't like it, too bad. Everything you say is offensive to me. Everything you say and you believe is d just deeply offensive to me. So I want you to shut up. I want then Maybe this is the way to go. Maybe this is the way to go. Maybe the way to go at it is to say, okay, so we're going to have uh, safe speech and safe spaces and so on, and we're going to determine that certain things that we're not allowed to talk about. But I find all of your politics to be deeply offensive to me and to many other people on this campus deeply offensive so we don't want to hear any more about bernie or socialism or hillary or anything don't want to hear any more about liberal politics nothing i find that deeply offensive it threatens me it doesn't make me feel safe give them the whole thing in their face and make sure you're not the only person in the class who does that and then and then find out what happens. If uh, Likely, they will say, well, you're all white people. It doesn't matter. In which case, you say, well, I don't need to be in school with racists. And you just leave. Leave. Um, <sighs> there comes a point when there really comes a point where you really just have to kind of – here's what it is. A building's on fire, and, and you see the smoke, and you run in there, and you try to get the, the, the people out, and then you run back in, and you try to get—I'm not talking about professional firefighters, you try, or, the, or, or them as well, for that matter. You try to get the people out. You try to get the cats out. You try to get everything you can, but there comes a point when the fire in that building becomes so consuming that now the firemen simply have to stand back and watch it burn. And that's— that's where I am with this thing. And these idiots, the reason they don't understand why we arm ourselves to the teeth is because they don't understand what they're doing when they talk about having a debate about whether or not we should have free speech. I say, this is, you know, I'm, I'm kind of inventing this as I go along, but really, here's my point. If colleges, if, if universities designed to open your mind and, and, and give you new perspectives, which it certainly did for me, 
And the people in the social justice warrior movement are so determined to prevent that from happening, then they are agitating to come out of college stupider than they were than they went in. And I'm not, I don't think we can stop that anymore. I don't think we should. They are going to come out of college with their degrees in all of these absurd subjects, and they are going to expect the world to fall down for them, and it's not going to happen. Because no matter how much, here's your consolation, Michael, uh, the real world is not like a university, and it never has been. Um, I admit that the, that the divergence between a university uh, environment and the actual environment is greater now than it was certainly at any time in my life, but universities have always been places where uh, the, the, this, just, this kind of silliness goes on. I don't know if I mentioned this on a show previously, but I did have this thought because needless to say, I've been thinking a lot about this whole thing and a heap of all these idiots and social justice warriors and so on. And it occurred to me not too long ago, maybe a month ago, I was talking with Natasha about this, I think. I said, you know, I never really thought about it until just now. But when you, when you get right down to it, we are sending humans to college to learn highly complex things and we're sending them at the most stupid point in their lives. This is kind of nuts. It is without question that this is the stupidest time in their lives. This is as dumb as they're going to be when they're in college. When they're little kids, they're learning and they're excited about things and, you know, and, 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 and they want to learn everything. Maybe you get them into high school and they start getting a lot more surly about it or they don't want to learn or anything, but they don't have the personal power to stop it. By the time you get to college, you feel like you have, and in this particular case, you do have. You can intimidate the, these people, intimidate the faculty, intimidate everybody, and it's their way of controlling their little world. And this is what teenagers do. Teenagers make... Teenagers are, are the stupidest people in the world. And I'm speaking from experience here. And so is every single one of you. And the main thing that makes teenagers so stupid is the absolute inability to recognize the fact that every single adult that has ever lived says, I was exactly like you, and you are wrong about this, and you are going to realize you're wrong about it. Every, so this is like, this is it. You know, if I sat there and said, you guys are so narrow-minded, you think you know so many things, but you don't, you're so stupid, and, and you're going to change so many of your opinions, they would say, no. I said, well, yes, the world doesn't work the way you think it will. And they say, well, that's because people like you gave up, because people like you lost your, your, um, your idealism and so on, but we are different. I said, you know what's really remarkable about that? What? That's exactly what we said. That's exactly what our fathers and mothers said. That's exactly what our grandparents said, what our great-grandparents said. Every single one of them said that to their parents. We're different than you. We're more noble than you are. We've got more commitment than you do. We're unique. God, I hate these people. I just hate them. The, 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 to sit there, and, and you, I have had a few experiences that maybe you haven't had. I've had to sit there, stand there, and talk for... 45 minutes, and just watch people just rolling their eyes and giggling and stuff. They don't know who was in World War II. And they, what's worse, what's worse than that is, they're convinced that it doesn't matter that they don't know anything. They're convinced that nothing that they don't know, uh, let me, that, that grammar was horrible, although that's not going to be a problem in the future, bad grammar, because no one's going to know what good grammar is. They don't know what they don't know. And they're just simply, this is the first time that I'm ever aware of, it's not actually not true, come to think of it, because, because since, since some of us read history and an even smaller number of us understand it, during the Middle Ages, students were basically terrorists. In, in medieval colleges throughout Germany and, and France, to a lesser degree England, 
students would run riot. They would demand this and they would demand that. And they and, and if somebody punished a student, and I'm talking about the 1400s, you know, 1500s. If somebody punished a student, then the students would riot and so on. They're the worst possible people in the world. And 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 they're without question, they're at peak stupidity just at the time we send them into college. And the, what we're seeing now is the result of, of natural selection downward. For three generations now, we've taken the most stupid, closed-minded people and given them the kind of education where the only future they have is to go into a university and teach people how to be even more stupid and closed-minded. So, um, yeah, Eric says what, but what you're, Eric Blake says what you're saying, Bill, is you hate your old self. I do. I despise, despise many of those moments. And I was one of the relatively um, open-minded ones. Just the, the, the arrogance, the arrogance of it, the, 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 just the, it's, it's almost like gluttony in a way. They're just so obesely stupid, these young people. And they don't get to hear anything different. And that's the difference between um, them and, and, and me. I, I went into college as, as completely convinced I knew everything as everybody else does. But when I went to school, I got to hear different opinions, and it changed my mind. But these people are, uh, these people are not going to have that experience. I got to tell you, uh, Michael, I would just say do what um, do what some of those suggestions are either say um you know uh free speech is not up for debate period a and leave it at that but and finish your degree obviously you've got i'm sure you've got a lot of time and, and money invested in the degree but you will find every day more and more that there that there is superb education out there on the internet and it's free and 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 if you want to get a really superb education you can buy some of these um video things or memberships at various websites and so on and that's not free but compared to the cost of a, of a university it's 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 terrible i really think that there should just be a couple of i mean something like i don't know phoenix university or something like that you know people talk about online degrees listen if you're if you're applying at a major law firm or you want to be maybe a CEO of a fight of a, of a you know high finance company, you may then need something like the master's degree uh, from Harvard or Yale, which used to mean something, but it doesn't mean anything now, and everybody knows it. So maybe you just need the piece of paper. I don't know. I don't have one. I'm a college dropout. Um, and I've never hired anyone, and I don't know anyone who's hired anyone on the basis of what school they went to. I've never seen it happen. I've never, ever, ever seen a case of somebody saying, hmm, this person is more personable and they are, they're, they're brighter. They certainly seem to be harder working. Uh, they've, they're more polite and they're more disciplined. On the other hand, this person went to Yale and had people go, this person is surly, lazy, rude, and mean, but they went to Yale. I've never heard anybody ever pick Yale. I just don't think it happens. I don't. I, uh, certainly in entertainment, it doesn't matter. So I think, I think we're not far away from... We're not far away from a world where there is going to be some kind of a, of a test administered. And I, I pray for this world. Where you will simply be given a rigorous, rigorous test. And you will either pass that test or fail. And if you pass that test, then you have the certification. If people need certification, and most people don't, but if you do, you do. I want to know... I've, I've been curious for quite a long time now. I want to know what kind of college degrees, how many and how advanced could this college dropout achieve nowadays? If I had to, if I had to write, if I had to pass the finals 
for either the bachelor's degree or the master's degree, maybe even in some cases the PhD degree, how many degrees could I simply pass now? I'll bet it's quite a few. I'll bet it's quite a few. I have, I have a fairly high level of confidence that I could pass a PhD uh, exam for history. I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm utterly certain I could do that. Utterly certain that I could have a doctorate in history. No, no question about that at all. Um, and I think I could probably get a pretty decent uh, degree in English. And I think there's some uh, chance I could get a decent degree in, I could certainly could pass the bachelor's degree in astronomy. There's no question about that. Um, and like, likewise in a number of other areas. I'll bet you anything I could hang five degrees on my wall if all I had to do was simply pass the same test that the people who were in the university for four years would. I bet you I get, I bet you five, and it may surprise me and be a lot more than that. So, the world is changing, and um, and it's changing for the worse, and it's also changing for the better. So, um, Michael, I'm sorry if I, if that answer disappointed you, but the idea that the thing is even up for discussion is so disgusting and repugnant to me that it really does become a case of at what point. Do you realize we're bailing as fast as we can, but this, this ship is going down. Uh, and look, this is an interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon because I know it sounds so depressing. But the fact is, if you look at history all the way back, history is the history of what was once normal becoming exceptional and societies being weighted down by the stupidity generated by their own success. That's basically the human wheel of uh, doom. We, I don't know how many times it's happened, 15 times, I could probably list 15 times it's happened. Um, uh, People get together, they work hard. All of the things that we consider to be virtues are virtues for a reason. They're courageous, they're, they're hardworking, they're loyal, they're, they're brave, they're, they're, um, they're prepared to sacrifice themselves, but they're not eager to. Um, they're disciplined, they're, they're filled with the character that comes with a fair amount of pain and suffering and work and all the rest of it. And these people build miraculous things. And then the children of those people at least had the influence of them upon them, but the children of the children may be a, a shred of it, but the great-grandchildren know nothing about it. They just assume that every single little miracle around them is, um, is absolutely automatic, and they get dumber and dumber and dumber, and that's when people like you come in, Michael. This is the big message in, in the message. This is the remnant message. As the, as the country gets stupider, people like you become more and more valuable. And again, I, I know this is not what I would have said even a year ago, but I would, if, if you want my from the heart advice, Michael, I would say, Put as little effort as you can um, into it. Get the stamp on the paper. Don't waste your, your God-given energy and ambition fighting with idiots. If they want to live in this world, let them live in it. And, and every day, the value of a university education becomes more and more meaningless. Every day. University and college used to be something people aspired to. You used to look up at them and say, oh, that, that person's well-educated and they speak well and, and, and maybe they make money and maybe they're, they learn discipline and they can talk about important things like mathematics and engineering and maybe they can build things that I can't build or maybe they know about what happened in the past. And a college degree was something that people looked up to. Now, it's something that people look down on and that's appropriate. That's the output of the universities now used to be, my wife Natasha tells a story uh, of, and this is certainly not the only time it ever happened, but it is a, a, it's a story kind of of human heartbreak, but it's so easy to understand. Uh, she was uh, close to a man who, who was a, a real expert at vodka, of all things. 
I mean, an internationally known expert, a magazine editor on the subject and so on. And from him, she heard the story about this small little um, distillery, I guess you'd call it, that was making the best vodka in the world. Just extraordinary. And it was selling for a good price because people who could tell the difference between bad vodka and good vodka understood that this was exceptionally good stuff. And the reputation that a bottle of this had got to be higher and higher and higher. And as that particular um, business got more and more valuable, came a point, this is back before Russia uh, really recovered from all the uh, criminalism that dogged them right after the fall of communism. This this. Uh, brand of vodka became more and more and more valuable because of the quality put into it. And at that point, a few people show up basically with guns and say, here's a little money. You can either have the little money and go, or you can stay here and we'll kill you, but we're taking this business. So that's what happened. So he took the money and got out. That's what anybody would do. That's what I would do, certainly. And so what happens? Well, these murderers and bastards don't know a damn thing about... Um, making vodka. And the most important thing is that they don't care. They know they don't know how to make any vodka. It doesn't matter to them. What they do is they start they start maximizing profit because this vodka had a high price because it was quality vodka and they start making it with junk, the cheapest stuff they can find. And the quality goes through the floor, but it takes a while for it to sink in. People used to think this was really high quality. And then over time, they realized what happened. They don't know. But, but during that time, these people made out like bandits. And that's basically what's happening with our college and education system in America now. Used to be something you could look up to. And then somebody came in and changed the formula. And now it's crud. And now it's got a reputation for crud. And that reputation for crud is going to continue to grow. And it's going to get cruddier and cruddier. One of my favorite words of all time, by the way, crud. It's such a perfect word. It's so useful. And it's going to get cruddier and cruddier and cruddier until finally the society that's going to generate these, these losers is going to be looking around and they're going to say, okay, well, colleges have produced these social justice idiots who, who are terrified of everything. They're 50 years old and they're crying because they see a billboard they don't like. These, these grown children, I don't want anything to do with them. Who got themselves their own education? Who was outside of this herd of, of morons? That'll be guys like you. So, remnant, you know, the, the, it's a hard thing to watch. Standards falling. It's a very hard thing to watch things coming apart like that. In fact, it's probably the hardest thing for somebody who's deeply committed to, to ideas and things that they believe in. It's, it's horrible to watch these things being chiseled away in front of your eyes. And I've come to realize that my job and your job and everyone who's watching this, their job, I've come to realize their job is not to stop this or turn it around because they can't, because you can't. Our job is to make sure that enough of this survives so that when this fire burns itself out, when the stupid have, have created so much stupidity like safe spaces that everything falls apart, then the people who will be left in the middle of these lost adult children will be people who know how to think, people who know how to build, people who can work together, people who are worthy of trust, needless to say, people who are armed, all the rest of it. It's a gift. It's, it's, a, it's a Fabergé egg, and, and it's our job to make sure that, because it's the same egg, by the way, it's the same egg from you know, 50,000 years ago. It's not a new one. It's the same egg. It got passed on to us, and it's our job to pass it on to other people. And if the rest of the world gets rockier and rockier, then that's our particular curse. Um, you know, neither you or I, Michael, had to go off and fight in World War II or any of that horror, and we didn't have to be there at Canny, and we didn't have to be there at the Somme or any of the rest of it. So that's been very nice, and I get to talk about computer games, and I'm not at any risk, and I've never been shot at, and all the rest of these aberrations of life. Um, here on planet Earth. 
So that's the good news. And the bad news is you have to watch this thing come apart. And so you can look at that as a tragedy or you can look at it as an opportunity or you can look at it as your duty, your, your duty. You don't know why you're here watching the show. Nobody who's watching the show knows how they got here. And the reason I know that for an absolute fact is because the guy doing the talking has no idea how he got here. So we're talking to each other now because a very small number of us have, for one reason or another, I, I, what, it's either just random chance or the grace of God, one or the other, have been given the vision to understand right and wrong and the mental ability to preserve all of the things that our entire species has worked so hard for for so long. So, yeah. If, I, if we were going to take every single hardworking person, I would give up. It, it, I've said this before, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I don't want to live, in, and I won't. I'm not going to move to, the, to South America. I'm certainly not going to live in the jungles or Mexico. I'm not going to move to Africa. I'm not going to move to Asia. But if, if they could just give us one state, pick one, pick a Kansas, Arkansas, uh, just pick one. Be nice if we had a seaport. Um, and just one place where you had to basically pass not so much an IQ test as an aptitude test in order to get in there. Just give us one state, and that state would be the most um, powerful nation in the world in 20 years or less, 10 probably. So, did I say revenant? I meant to say remnant, Troy. Stephen's coming up. I might have said revenant. I meant remnant. If you really want um, a pocket education, um, Michael and everybody else as well, um, go find an essay called Isaiah's Job by Albert Nock, N-O-C-K. Um, it's profoundly good. It was given to me when I started writing this stuff back in end of 2002, early 2003. I think it was Kim and Connie Dutois sent it to me. Albert Nock. I say his job. He basically says, Isaiah was called by God to go and preach in this, in this town of heathens surrounded by social justice warriors, you know, wearing robes and sandals like they do today. Um, and I say, well, you know, God's calling. So I say, it says, yes, Lord, I'd be happy to do it. And then, uh, then God says to Isaiah, but before you go, you should know, um, no one's going to listen to you. And Isaiah says, you're, you're not going to be drawing big crowds. You're not going to be changing minds. You're just going to go and, 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 and say these things that I want you to say. And Isaiah said, well, Good idea, Lord. Um, but could you could you let me know um, why I'm going? If I'm not going to be heard, if you're sending me here to 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 spread your word and no one's going to listen to me, no one. I'm, why? Basically, God said to Isaiah, "There is a remnant. There is a small group of people out there. A very small group of people, and you will be speaking to them." And you can't recruit them, and you can't sift them, you can't even really find them. They'll find you. But your job is to speak to the remnant. Because if one person in 10,000 hears it and gets it, that's all we need. And once you get to that place, you begin to look at things a little differently. You know, just begin to think, okay... It's beyond, um, there's a difference between prevention and perseverance. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say prevention and um, it'll come to me. 
Anyway, they'll come to me eventually. Um, I had a uh, fun dinner with uh, Mr. X last night, who uh, was, haven't seen too much of lately, but f uh, formerly held the flaming swords outside the door of uh, the uh, Stratosphere Lounge here. He, he was talking about a lot of things uh, that, that were very, very interesting. Um, none of which I can remember right at this moment. It'll come to me, but the question is when. Maybe if I move on and do another question. This will be question number three. What the hell was it? That was so good. Huh. Um, Jake Dustin says, thanks for answering our last question about PhD applications. I've decided to shut my Facebook and other accounts down temporarily under the guise of unplugging from my phone for a few months. Uh, Jake, I think, was the guy who said, should he erase his social media history if, uh, as a conservative, and I told him definitely. New question. If someone in your family says they don't like to talk about politics but holds views you believe are wrong, should you make an effort to have them talk about it or just leave them alone? The, um, the family member, Jake, is very different than the lunatic in the same college as you. Just let it go uh, because, because they're not like us. We can tolerate people with differing opinions, and sometimes we learn something from them. Not too frequently, as it turns out, but sometimes we do. And we don't demonize the individual because they have a different set of beliefs than we do. So if that were the case, then you could certainly engage them. But that's not, that's not the left. Progressives are an echo chamber, and they have to be because nothing they do works or makes sense. So they have to keep repeating the same mantra. It's almost like a chant. It's almost like, it's almost like they're in a, in a state of um, deep meditation, except there's no meditation involved. Hypnotism, is, hypnosis is a better word. So everybody has to tell each other the exact same thing so that nobody starts thinking about things. Because if you start thinking about things, you get in trouble. Quick, quick, quick example is I've heard so many comedians talking about things like Sandy Hook and, my God, what is it going to take to get some gun control around here? And uh, and yet, I've never heard anybody who could respond to this answer. 30, 40, 50 years ago, guns were everywhere. There were no restrictions on gun purchases at all. You bought one at a hardware store. You bought one at Sears. You walked right up to the counter. You plunked down the money. You got a rifle, and you left, and that was it. There was no gun control at all. Guns were everywhere. Every high school had a shooting team everywhere. We played with guns as kids with little caps so they made gun-like noises and smelled gunpowder. Guns were everywhere. And there were none of these mass shootings. That's evidence. It's evidence that increasing gun control is leading to increasing shooting. Now, that is a correlation without a causality. Because what's really leading to these mass shootings is, while we did not have gun control before, we also did not have 24-hour news before. We did not have the ability to make a lonely psychopath into a worldwide name. And this is insurmountable. 50 years ago, very easy to get guns. Everybody's playing with guns. Get a gun anywhere you want to. No mass murders and no 24-hour news cycle. Now, it's much harder to get a gun, but the news cycle has to be filled and people's names and faces. One of these things has changed. Well, both of them have changed, but th th these trend lines cross and it's clear which it is. So, so my point is just some people just don't want to hear that. They can't bear it. So I would just advise you to just let it go. You know, they can't handle the argument. And, and, and the worst of it is not only, not only can you not argue with them, but they keep poking you. They just keep poking you because religion is their life. And the idea that you think differently than them is so profoundly disturbing to them because the idea of anyone thinking differently 
than the way they think sets up all kinds of unpleasant things in their little heads. They start having to think, how could somebody believe that? What, what's wrong with them? I thought he was a smart guy. So just let him go. Uh, Jake, you don't want to lose your family. And believe me, I'm speaking from experience here. My close family, but certainly cousins and so on, the whole thing. They wouldn't leave me alone. And I never, ever went in there guns blazing. As a matter of fact, I turned my weapons in at the door when I would go home for Thanksgiving. And uh, kids who I took very good care of when I didn't have any money at all just started treating me like I was, you know, Hitler. And I had a choice of either taking it, which I did for a while, or shooting back, and I would have blown them out of the water because I'm a professional. This is what I do for a living. Or just not going back there anymore. And that's what I chose. I chose part three. We have our ups and downs in this world. Um, so uh, let's see. I think this will be the last one. Tom uh, Bazell uh, asks, uh, could you share some times in which you have seen the light bulb switch on for a progressive when they realized they were wrong? What was that you said, and can that process be repeated? The most dramatic example of that, I've talked about it a couple times before, um, is not something I saw firsthand, but was told to me by somebody who watched it happen. And it was a um, probably a, a, a black American in his 40s probably went to this party and didn't realize that virtually everybody there was Republicans. And when he found out that almost everyone around him was there, he basically stood up and said, I'm leaving. I'm not going to be seen in the company of all these racist Republicans. To which some person said, okay, yeah, it's fine. But Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves and Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. And this guy turned around to him and spat it out. He said, he was not yeah, he was. He was not. There's no way. Abraham Lincoln was not a Republican. Now we live in the world of uh, these things, you know. So people say, just, hey, don't take my word for it. Just look it up. Just look it up. Okay, I will. So he did. And then he was gobsmacked, thunderstruck. He was speechless because he looked, and then he did it a couple more places, and he realized that, that Lincoln was a Republican. And they said you could see the gears turning as his entire world came apart. And, and somebody said, and so was Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass said the Republican Party is the, is the, the rock anchor of the, of the black. And, and the guy said, Look, please just stop. I'm not, just, I can't take any more than this right now. I gotta, I gotta really just got to I got to sit and think about this. So it happens. Um, I've had a number of people. It's been a great honor and certainly a real pleasure of mine to have a number of people say to me either in person or through uh, social media that, that something I said or a couple of videos I did changed their mind about things, made them a conservative. That's a very, very, very uh, humbling and... Uh, extremely flattering thing to hear. But I don't know that I've seen anybody just have the light bulb go off. There's one other person who I got to know well and who I admired who um, was a big old liberal and she, she, she told a, a mutual friend that she, of all the videos I've done, it was just almost like a throwaway line. It was about my trip to Guantanamo Bay. And I was talking about how, how big that, that, you know, the Straits of Florida, 90 miles of open ocean, it's gigantic. I said, there's never seen, ever, ever been one raft that went from America to Cuba to get the free health care. Hundreds of thousands of people have risked their lives and many have lost their lives to come here. And she said, I started thinking about that sentence and I could not find a way around it. And so she started questioning everything, and, and it can happen. Um, we got another, uh, I think we have four or five segments of the interview with Chadwick Moore. If you saw that, it's really good. If you didn't, it's on the website. 
uh, Chadwick Moore was a uh, I, I made the mistake of saying editor in chief. He was editor at large for two of the uh, most well-read gay magazines in the world. These are Harvard-level bona fides for for a progressive, and he was a gigantic progressive. And he he said he started to hate the left. He didn't like the intolerance. He didn't like the attitude. Didn't like the people. And the only thing he knew was that Republicans were worse. That's all he'd ever been taught. And somehow, somewhere, um, he uh, he started listening, and he found out that. It was not true. He, he basically wrote an article, and all of his progressive friends, people he'd known for most of his life, basically, he never heard from them again. He got a bunch of death threats from the left. He was called a self-hating uh, gay. I'm sure they didn't use that word. And they said he was doing it for the money or for the attention. His response was, I had the money and the attention. Doing this has cost me the money and the attention. Social suicide was a term he used. I'd never heard it before. It's a great term. And then he went on to say that of all the things, we talked about this last week, of all the things that the left had done and all of these horrible, horrible, real genuine cruelty towards him for having switched sides, he said the, the nastiest thing that anyone ever said to him from the conservative side was he got an email from a guy who said, uh, uh, Dear Mr. Moore, I just wanted you to know I'm a pretty much the exact opposite of you. I'm a, I'm a devout Christian. I'm a, I've got a cattle ranch in Texas. I'm heavily armed. and I don't approve of your lifestyle one bit, but I wanted you to know uh, that wanted to just say welcome to the party and I love you. He said that was the worst thing he heard from the conservatives. And I've heard that kind of story from so many gay people, so many black people, so many Hispanics, so many professional women who, when I say professional women, I don't mean women who are out there working in, I'm talking about people who were, who were feminists, they were professional women's rights advocates, and they just said, we just realized it was just a lie, which is why you cannot speak the truth out there which is why they will not listen to you. I used to do colleges. I've done colleges for quite a few years. And there was a time when you would walk into a room, a hostel room, but people would listen. And after it was over, they'd get into a discussion. You'd get people thinking about things. But now you walk in there and people just start screaming at the top of their lungs. They can have that. They can have it. You want it, If it's that important to you to be that's stupid, then I'm not the kind of guy to take away something as precious to you as your own ignorance is. So, you know, there you go. Well, hey, look at the time. It's been almost exactly an hour. Um, sorry to cut this one short, but uh, I figured it was better a short one than, than none. I have a quick little camera test I have to do, and I have to jump on by the hangar on the way back. I might get the airplane flying again after a mere 11 months, something like that. So, uh, I think that'll do it for episode number 171 of the Stratosphere Lounge, made possible by the those of you who have had the, um, the generosity and the vision to understand that some of this stuff's important enough to pay for, and, um, and that's... Uh, that's why I get to... to do this full time. Um, all right, that'll do it. So uh, once again, you guys be careful out there, have fun. And um, unless something comes up, uh, I will see you all next week.